Hi, I'm Colin Likes. Uh, thank you, Maxon, so much for having me. And obviously I wish that we could all be together at SIGGRAPH this year, but since we can't, I'm really glad that we can still do this digitally. So I work at Gunner, which is an illustration-based animation studio, and we're in Detroit, Michigan. And we like to say that we're always trying to make work that stirs that little feeling in your gut. Um, so we've always used Cinema 4D. It's always been a go-to for us. Uh, we find it really easy to use um, and also super powerful. So I'm gonna show you uh, a reel of Gunner's work. It is from 2018, but it'll give you a feeling of what we do. And also a reel, a shorter reel of, of my work, uh, more focused on stuff that I've done, personal and at Gunner. So that'll have some more recent work by Gunner as well. So a little background on me. Before I was an animator, I was a painter and an installation artist. And when I was painting, I loved to use oils and it was kind of a nice tactile experience. And when I would make installations, um, I would make pieces on the ceiling or outside, um, kind of high up. And it was meant to be viewed by holding a mirror and looking down into the mirror and walking kind of underneath it. And it basically would trick your brain into thinking you were walking on top of whatever was reflected. Um, so in the piece that I'm showing you, it was outside. So it felt like you were walking on like stepping stones over the sky. So uh, I was really interested in perception and how we kind of interpret or even misinterpret the world kind of through our senses and also through language. Um, so in terms of how I got into VR, it's really obvious what we've all gained by working digitally. Um, but when we're, when we're making creative decisions, it's usually kind of on this scale, maybe a click or um, maybe our fingers or wrists if we're drawing, maybe even from our elbow if we're really lucky and have a nice Cintiq. Um, but, and that, that's actually really great and efficient and clever for a lot of the decisions that we're making. But um, I missed kind of being able to use gestures to whip something up when I started working in 3D um, until virtual reality. So really I'm focusing today on making 3D assets for a traditional 3D pipeline, but using virtual reality. So if you're modeling something organic, especially if you have to do a lot of it, like world building or building out a whole scene, and especially if you don't have a ton of time, um, it's really been a lifesaver for us. So it's expressive and it's also, I, I think modeling and virtual reality is also a lovely entry point for people who have different skill sets like drawing or painting or sculpting um, in the physical world. So um, basically I feel like working in virtual reality is such a great way to tap back into the fact that we are creatures and um, we come pre-programmed with all of this embodied knowledge 
So that's just to say, there are things that we already know how to do in our bodies and, and we know how to do them well and they make us better creators. So um, if you wanna change something, you can grab or pull. We already have all this nuance in our hands and we can turn around something and look at it from different angles. Um, so it just invites this immediate connection with the body. Um, and so I think some of the biggest benefits of working in VR are being able to get complex, so complexity and speed. And then also as like kind of a side benefit, it is just, you're just more in your body. And so I, I think it's kind of, it feels good. Like it feels good to be able to stand and be able to use, use your whole arm again, to be able to make work from your whole body actually. Um, so at Gunner, we've been working on finding some sweet spots in terms of making assets between the kind of gestural expressive fluidity of working in virtual reality, but then also bringing it back to some of the things that uh, um, Cinema 4D does better. There's a lot more control and power and refinement. So finding the sweet spot between those two things. Um, I'm gonna show you what some of those sweet spots are. Okay, so section one, I'm gonna call this the blend titles. The first thing you're gonna see is starting in Cinema 4D, we're gonna prep some base geometry and set up some vertex colors before sending our sculpt to virtual reality. We're gonna bring in our reference geometry into Oculus Medium, and I'll show you the basics of sculpting in Medium, kind of show you around, um, and then we'll also show how to export that. We're gonna process our new VR file in Cinema. We're gonna break that sculpt into layers. We're gonna optimize the mesh with something called Quad Remesher, and we're gonna add some subtle animation with the shader effector. Okay, so first I wanna show you a project um, from inside of our blend opening title sequence. We created this as an opening celebration for the Blend Conference in Vancouver last fall, which was wonderful. Uh, when they asked us to do this piece, we got really ambitious with it. We did a fully 3D piece that was four minutes long. So let me play it for you, just the first minute or so, because it has a lot of environments that I ended up sculpting on. Then I'm gonna take you on like a little tour through the VR set. <laughs> So I'm gonna take you through the process of going from cinema to VR and back again. This happens to be also the two minute tip that I shared at the Blendfest in case it seems familiar to anybody. One of the things cinema can do is to be able to see a style frame on top of your image and be able to have this predictable camera with this the right focal length that we're gonna work with through everything. So if you're in a position like us where you are on a big team and you wanna make things match the style frame, um, that's part of why we started in cinema. We sculpted kind of all of these pieces out. Now, 
to be able to send this, we're actually going to send a copy of this base geometry into Oculus Medium to sculpt on top of. So if I'm going to be sending this into VR to work from, I'm actually going to make a copy of this geo and put it all on one layer together. So I'm going to take this out. Okay, so I have this now. I'm going to connect to objects and delete. So right now, this is just kind of a, a throwaway version of, of the Geo. Um, to be able to send this into virtual reality, I would love to be able to see exactly where I can ultimately see in the, in the project. Otherwise, this is gonna come in as these kind of floating islands, and if I'm painting on this guy, in VR, I can't quite tell actually where it turns the corner and where I can't see. So I might waste time or like painting on this arch and end up painting down here, even though it doesn't actually show up at the end. So when we're gonna select this, let's go up to our rectangle selection tool. And for here, you wanna click on only select visible elements because basically we want it to just scrape along what we can see from the camera. So I'm gonna hit U, Y to grow the selection. Now I want to color it with the vertex color tag. So textures don't really come in with this, the way that we're gonna import this into Oculus Medium, but vertex information does. So we're actually just assigning color to each individual point. So to do this, I'm gonna right click and go to other tags, vertex color. Let's say black is applied to everything. And then I'm just gonna choose a random color. This is not gonna show up in the final piece. It's just to distinguish I'm going to hit apply selected. Now if I did this right, let's get out of the camera. Yes. Okay. This is all we need to export. So this is just kind of a habit. I'm in the habit of going to a new project and just dropping in what we need, especially when working between VR. I've had strange things happen where um, other layers come with things. So just a little habit. I'm going to go to file, export, I love FBX. And we want to make sure it brings vertex colors. Just a funny little thing, um, when we bring this into Oculus Medium, it's going to pop up sideways. And at my blend talk, I was like, this is strange, so here's our workaround. And I found out why it's there's Y up programs and Z up programs, and probably more that I don't even know about. But <laughs> I've heard that they come from. Uh, there's a lineage of architectural uh, programs started out with like X and Y's on the ground, so the new dimension went up. And then drawing programs start out with X and Y's up and down, and so the new dimension, Z, went back in space. I'm curious if that's actually true. If someone knows, please get back to me. But for now, so that's what this is talking about. I messed with it, I tried to like correct for it and send it back, and it actually was still coming in sideways and my workaround is actually still faster for me, so I'm going to leave this as default. Just make sure you got your vertex colors and click OK. So I'm going to save this in my VR folder. I like to have three folders. There's going to be your output, your project files, where you save the project file itself for Medium, and then the ref, which we bring in. Because we're sending FBXs back and forward, it can get kind of confusing. Race. Okay. So I'll see you over in Medium. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, so I'm hitting this yellow button. I'm going to do File, Add Mesh as Clay. I'm bringing in my base ref, Add. So it's coming in big and sideways like I talked about. I'm going to get all the information I can, and I do not want them on separate layers. So with this is coming in as actual, like, clay, I'm trying to air quotes, clay that I could actually just continue to draw on and drill into and mess with. Um, but really, I'm just kind of using it as scaffolding. It's kind of a reference. Okay, so and this was part of my blend tip. Um, when I shared this last fall, do this left joystick down to get your menu. And right now, um, I want to lock the spaces, world space, and the sculpt and just leave the scene origin open. So that's locking what it needs to lock to make sure that it's gonna go back into cinema nicely. But I can still, just with these back um, buttons here, these yellow buttons, pull this back, and now I have my reference. Okay, so this black box, what you're seeing, 
is um, we're working with voxels, which is basically a 3D version of pixels. And it's saying for each individual layer, you can have so much data. You can have it be large and low poly and like not detailed, or you can have it be small and really high detail. So I'll make a new layer. And if you make it big, I'm going to go to my clay tool. And I can kind of draw, and it's pretty lightweight. I'm going to go left joystick down to see the resolution of it. It's actually still fairly high. You can decrease it, make it chunkier. And you can actually see that box getting bigger. Let me increase it. You can see the walls moving in. OK, and it's getting heavier. It's thinking harder and harder. You don't necessarily want more resolution. Um, you might be drawing, and you'll hit the border just like the Truman Show. And if that happens and you want it to be that detailed, that's totally fine. Then you just make a new layer. And this one can kind of sit wherever you want. I'm just going to make a couple of example plants. And when I hold this down, I have kind of my backup tool. So my smooth is my backup. When I hold the left joystick forward, you can see all these lovely tools. That pink arrow means that that tool is my like second hand tool. So by default, kind of got this clay moving, hold that down, and it smooths. I'm, if I wanted this to smooth faster, I could decrease the res, and then it's, it's almost like softer. You can change that too, by the way. Hover, if I hover, and then click that left arrow. Now I get this flatten tool as my backup, which is really lovely. If there's something where you're kind of going back and forth, oh, let's say I'm drawing, flattening, drawing, flattening. It's nice to have that. Through the blend titles, actually I would use this, this technique here to make a lot of the rocks. But right now we want plants. OK, so I'm going to take a minute, draw some plants. OK, I want to talk for a second about probably my favorite tool might be the Move tool. And this was just the most satisfying thing when I started. Also, just a little word about color in here. Um, it's vertex colors, so it's assigned to all the individual vertices. So there is this paint option, kind of spray paint. And this is great if you don't need to retopologize it when it comes back into cinema. So that just depends on the scene. Sometimes if, if it's not going to be a heavy scene, or if you really just want to do it fast. Um, but something like this, this scene was going to get really heavy with a lot of objects. So sometimes if we're going to retopologize it, we just didn't, didn't quite bother yet. I'm going to make a new layer, just for the stuff that goes up on the arch. Sometimes it's nice to use the vertex colors just to sort of stay organized. And so I want to smooth this out, but it's not smoothing quickly enough. So that probably means it's too high res. I'm going to decrease the res a bit and then make it gooier. OK, so actually one of the first things that I should have done is to bring in our reference image. OK, here's our reference. We had this kind of like loose frame here. Also, um, in that coral reef that I showed you, I'll just show you kind of some quick techniques that I would have used for that. Make a new layer here. Oh, my new layer is a little low. I used a lot of this cylinder tool to make those kind of mushroomy things. And what's really great is, especially when something's organic like this, you can just kind of draw them out. Really nice and intuitive. Kind of use the move tool. looks kind of like some volcanic rock or something easily quickly gets pretty cool looking and pretty complex also it's kind of neat to add additive and then subtractive processes so I'll add this guy in 
subtract right into it. Okay, that's way too high. Decrease that a little bit. Ugh, this is really gross. But it looks pretty seaweedy. And then, just kind of grab it, pull it. So, that is, you can tell, I mean, I made that, I don't know, 30 seconds, how quickly you could make a whole coral reef, especially once you get comfortable with the tools. Okay, so let's say that I filled up my whole scene, I'm ready to export it. Bring this over here. I don't want to export my base ref, so I just turn off a little eyeball, and it'll just have what I drew. I'm going to turn this off too. And then you just do File, Export, and we get some settings that come up. Um, it's pretty heavy actually, so even 50% comes in with a lot of tries. Um, you can export the vertex colors. There is a textures option. I haven't really gotten into it. it it's using UV maps that are kind of intuited. Um, so I've basically just wanted to make my own. Um, so I'm going to do FBX and export. You just kind of choose where you want it to go and then hop back in. Okay, so to bring in our FBX, I'm going to bring it in here with the Merge Project, Blend Demo, and hit OK to the defaults, and bloop, it plops just where we want it to be. I don't know why that always makes me so happy. Just like, it works, it works. You can see these came in on their own layers, just like they were separate in Medium. You can see those vertex colors there. Um, so I want to show you um, a plugin that I love called Quad Remesher. And what this does is basically is a almost one click way to remesh. You can see this kind of polys look like coming back from medium. Um, so if I go to poly mode, we can see this up here, this top piece has 28,848 um, polys. And we don't need that many. So from 28,000, I don't know, this is pretty simple. So let's try 2,000. Now at first when I saw this, I was excited because it used vertex color. I thought that it would preserve the, the actual visual color coming in, but it actually is something a little bit more unique and useful. I'm going to take over this tag that it already created. Um, and I'm going to make it black. Using the vertex color, it looks for a perfect cyan and red. So red means there's going to be more detail there if you paint red on here. And if you use cyan, it's going to actually re remesh with fewer quads. So let's try it. Yeah. Paint this up here. All right, this is just for example's sake. <laughs> okay, so I'm keeping this checked, and let's give this a try. Now you can see it didn't have a ton to work with, but up where I painted the cyan, it was looser, and the red, it kind of um, is more concentrated there. So that's kind of a nice way to control where the detail is going to be. Now these little guys. Something that we ended up using very often. If I hit Shift C to bring up this menu. Polygon groups to objects. Click on that and it actually puts each of these on its own layer. And it kind of keeps this one up top, which we don't need. So now we have all of these. They still just have the same uh, axis here as because they came in all together. So we can go up to Mesh, Axis, this axis center. I would love for each of these to have their own axis at the bottom of each of them because I want to set up some kind of rotation to make them kind of blowing in the wind together. So I take this Y all the way down to negative 100%, execute it, and now each of them have their own axis point at the bottom. Um, now, if I wanted to wave them in the wind, I would put them 
and a null. Also, I should have retopoed them before I split them apart. So quickly, I just want to show you how to get kind of a, a floaty movement between them all. So something that's actually pretty useful for this is this shader effector. I can drop it in here with this null. I'd like to do the rotation. Let's do like 7% here. Um, shading, I'm going to add some noise. And I'm going to make this larger, let's say 1800%. So I want it to just be kind of like a large noise that's going to move over all of these and make them rotate. So this is kind of what direction it's going to move in. And let's give this a really slow speed. So this wasn't working at first because I needed the deformation to go to object. Let's go with seven. So now when I hit play, I like this because they all kind of stick together as if it was kind of the same wind moving past all of them. So especially when you're building a scene that kind of has a lot of complex parts, that's just an easy way to create some basic blowing in the wind kind of movement on these objects. Section two, crocus. So what you're gonna see in this is we're gonna use the Cinema 4D Sculpt brushes to modify and enhance our VR sculpt. We're gonna look at how to use the weight tool to select and softly paint vertex maps. We're gonna use the restriction tag with our vertex maps um, and use deformers to animate. So I sculpted all of this, or most of it in VR. You can kind of see, I got to do kind of detail down into this crocus flower. This is just kind of a springy project that I wanted to do, personal project. So as you could see before, it's it's pretty subtle animation. Um, and this is a technique that you'd really want to use if you didn't need a huge range of motion. I mean, there's a reason when, when you see a character in an A pose or a T pose, they are in a good position to do anything from there. It's like a good starting point. And when we go in and sculpt something that's already posed, the purpose isn't to have tons of, a, a huge range of movement. Um, in this particular case, I really just wanted to make it look how I wanted it to look in this grasping position. And I just knew that it wasn't gonna need a whole ton of animation. So it's my little workaround. Um, a way to, to animate without necessarily going in and creating joints, which is another another great way to do it, um, but that's not what I did here. So all of these are deformers. <laughs> um, start to turn these on to show you. Let's look at this. So this knuckle one, for example. So I created just this bend kind of around the knuckles. And because the flower is also parented to the hand, these deformers are also going to affect that. And obviously, you know, if you push it too far, it breaks. <laughs> so again, that's kind of the limitations of this, this particular um, way of working with things. I knew it was gonna be subtle. Um, so how do you make it affect only parts of the whole of the rig and not, not everything? So something like, this index finger. Just kind of the tip of the finger. But it's sort of stacked with the whole object, so why is it not affecting everything else? Because of the lovely restriction tag. So um, you can see up here, I actually painted vertex maps for each area that I wanted to move. I love, I love vertex maps. I didn't get them for a while, um, but they were kind of the thing that was waiting to solve my problems. <laughs> I'll show you on a new, a new model, sort of how I went about that. This is the output from the sculpt. So um, with the settings that come in, I'm just okay with the default. 
Um, and in this particular case, I did not start out in cinema and then make some base geo that I sent to cinema or sent to VR to draw on top of and back. So that's why it's uh, not just sitting right on top of where this hand is. Um, I just started out in VR and that's fine sometimes. So these layers come in from medium. I think this is a blank one, it doesn't have a vertex color tag on it. So I'm just going to hit option G, group things together. If I didn't know where it was, I could bring it down to, let's see this, um, underneath this null and hit reset PSR, just so it kind of brings it to you. And then it'll keep that position. I can pull it out, kind of be back on the root again. So, scalar up. So you can see that what I did in VR was pretty close, but um, ultimately it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Um, so I'll get to the, the vertex maps in just a second, but just in terms of processing all of this, let's say this is the hand, the rest of these are the flower. Um, so I would use, you can see kind of these like slightly gnarly geo coming in. I'm going to turn this off just for now. Okay, so here's our lovely geo. I'm going to use the quad remesher. And to see how many polys, I'm going to go over to um, the poly mode. I do not need that many. Let's see how it does with like 10,000. So the edge loops, I didn't talk about this before, you can use this to actually kind of select an edge path and it'll create polys kind of working around it, which is nice. Um, I'm not gonna get into that too much now, just uh, for the sake of keeping it simple. If you wanna watch a really great talk on topology though, you can watch my friend Jess Herrera's um, SIGGRAPH talk from last year about good topology. It is excellent, definitely go check that out. Um, all right, so this is looking much nicer. So if this was coming in, basically what I did before was to use those sculpt tools. I'm gonna go to mesh. We have this menu here. Basically it's a lot of the same tools from if you went to this sculpt layout, um, but you don't necessarily have to move over there. And then these sculpting brushes. Uh, Cinema has a really lovely way of being able to sculpt to get a lot more detail um, I, if you start to subdivide. And then you can see this blue tag popped up. And there's a great way to use these tools, um, do this detail, and then bake that down into a displacement map. Um, I'm not going to get into that today because you need to head into that with some good UVs and there's only so much I could put <laughs> in this talk. Um, but we, we also love doing that. But for now, I'm going to show you more again how you can use these tools actually just on the geo kind of as is. So this is not the most lightweight way to, to model. Um, and just compare it again. You can see I ended up pulling this out. I really liked that. I don't know, it just needed a little bit more of a kind of a tail. <laughs> So I sort of, this is how I just sort of pushed and pulled it. I also loved the, the knife tool for working with something like a crease. And like I said, I love, I love the BR tools, but sometimes uh, you just want a little bit more control. So that's kind of how I got those creases going in. So. Then how about just moving these parts of the finger individually? So you want to go in and just select the part that you want to move. So let's say we want let's say we want to do that index finger again. I really like using the rectangle selection. I'm going to turn this off just for simplicity. We don't want only select visible elements because I want my selection to go all the way through right now. I just find that it's my favorite selection tool. I just 
just seems pretty like thorough. It picks up a lot of those points. Okay. And then just to clean up a little bit after, I'm going to do the live selection. And now only select visible. This I just want to get a couple of these. Nope. Okay, unz, undo, control, command Z, and then I'm hitting shift to just add to that selection. So that can be pretty rough actually, because we're gonna smooth it in a second. Dang it. Let's see. So then you wanna go to select down to set vertex weight. And this pops up, sometimes it's at a, a zero, but you type in 100. Now we get that red and yellow. So basically it's saying yellow is where there's 100%, red is where there's 0%. Then now there's this new little tag, vertex map tag. If you double click it, it'll bring up uh, a new tool. Your mouse will change and you could add more to it in the painting. It doesn't have to just be a uh, defined by selecting points. But what I've been doing is smooth. So you can go in and smooth this guy out. It surprisingly feels like a really nice soft gradient given the fact that we are only working with information for each of these individual points. All right. It seems like a lot of work to go through and make a rig for every joint or whatever, but uh, it worked for me. And actually, once you get in the zone, it goes pretty fast. Um, now let's get our bend deformer. I'm going to bring it down here and hit fit to parent just to sort of shrink it in a little. Let's get it closer. And I like to, <laughs> it's going to look crazy for a second. I like to actually bend it a little bit just so you can see which direction it wants to go in. So you can see there. Just do that again. Okay, so it's kind of starting from here and bending in that direction, so I'm going to flip this around. And I'm just kind of trying to make this snug fit on this joint. Okay, so it's obviously still affecting everything else. And that is because we haven't used a restriction tag yet. So you're going to find that under right click on the bend deformer and go to rigging tags restriction. So um, when I was going through and painting all of these Vertex maps areas for everything. It obviously really helps to name them, so that's pretty easy just down here. Call that index tip. Now, with the restriction tag, it's like, okay, who do I restrict it to? Just drag that guy in. Now, it will only bend where you want it to bend. There's a couple options. Keep axis length, kind of that keeps things a little bit more in control. This looks like I could paint that vertex map a little bit differently. Um, but so that is how I went about animating this. So this piece and the next one that I'm going to show, they're kind of this funny in-between of sculpting something that's going to be still almost like a marble sculpture and something that is supposed to move. Um, I just really like it when I want to quickly make something that looks a really specific way. So I'm going to show you kind of another version of that. Uh, with the next piece. Section three, love burbs. In this one, you're gonna see using deformers to animate and I'm gonna use some basic espresso tag for um, pinning down the position of an object to a point. I'm going to show you the setup that I came up with for stop motion animation in VR in Oculus Medium. We're going to talk about animating layers in Cinema 4D to create that stop motion effect. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, so that's kind of a cute little loop. Uh, we made this for Valentine's Day, and it started out with a drawing by Sarah Beth Morgan, uh, who's excellent. So um, this piece, I did sculpt um, this all, all three of the birds in VR, but I did something very different for this third one here. So because we weren't planning on moving them very much, uh, I figured that I could sculpt them in position like I've talked about. Um, it's not a rig with full movement, uh, and that's okay. In this case, we didn't really need it. Um, I used the same process for animating these as I did for the crocus hand that we just looked at. You can see deformers. I really love how this one in particular turned out. So these two are kind of animated traditionally. Also use that restriction tag and vertex map technique, which worked really nicely. I did use a little bit of espresso to get the beaks to stay put. I'm going to build this from scratch. I'm going to build you a new one. So let's say we have this sphere here. And this cone can act as our beak. Um, I'm just going to keep it up here just to keep it simple. Okay. So for the cone, I'm going to hit C and use the same technique to get this axis point to the bottom. Okay. So now let's say I just, I want to find a point on the sphere that this is always going to follow, sort of no matter what. I'm going to hit C and also make this editable. So let's say that I want it to be this point here. The ex Expresso tag goes on the object that's going to be pinned. So I'm going to right click, go to Programming Tags, Expresso. So this little area pops up. I'm going to pull in my two objects. And point, which you can search for in here, because I want it to stick to a point. OK, so head is the object that we're going to be sticking to. And eventually this point position, it's going to lead to the beak's global position. Okay, so it just looked like it disappeared, and that's because it just popped inside. Um, it, we didn't tell it yet which point that you're supposed to look at. Okay, so I have this point selected. There's a little menu down here called the Structure menu. And it's kind of an index of points, and there are numbers assigned to each one. So if you hit Shift N, it looks through past points, and N, it goes to the next point that's highlighted. So this looks like this is 109. Okay, so if we go back to the attributes, now that we know that's 109, type it in here. We want to say use deformed points because we might actually use a deformer on this original mesh. That's part of the attraction of being able to animate this way. Now it knows 109. We also want to go back to this node and set this to generators and this to 100. If there's people who know, there definitely are people who know a lot more than me about this, they can understand the details, but this is kind of just from our uh, trial and error. So now you can turn this and it'll stay married to that point. Um, there definitely must be ways also to keep this following the rotation, although this object, the bird, I'm not actually rotating him, I'm just deforming the points. So that's why we need to use this because I'm not actually going to be using this kind of rotation method. I would be, let's put a bend deformer on this head, fit to parent. See, it's going to follow when I start bending. So I have to say I actually, I put this in a null and I animated the rotation by hand. So that's just kind of where I was at the time. I'm sure there's people who can take this to an absolutely amazing level. That was just my tiny little intro to Espresso. Go hide these. So you can see here, I had this kind of rotate beak that I just did this a little bit by hand. 
What's going on with this third bird? Oh, by the way, I also did sculpt all of these guys in VR. Kind of brought them in and just remeshed them and ended up just tr traditionally texturing them. Same with the flowers. But so for this guy, this is because I did him with stop motion. Meaning, let's take a look at the cell that my lovely colleague Rachel did to um, kind of set us up for the 3D motion. Okay, so here's the cell Rachel did. The bird flies in, they're kind of freaked out, look at him slowly, kind of moves up, kiss, kiss, and then he takes off. And those frames where he's actually on his way out are pretty extreme and kind of fun and deformed. So something that I love about working at Gunner is that often we decide what we want something to look like or move like before we think about what the tools can do and what's going to be, oh, is that doable or not doable? Um, do this in 3D. <laughs> it seems like, wait, what? How would we make a character that can be deformed like that? So I thought this would be a perfect example to see if we could use kind of the gesturalness and speed of VR to just make a new sculpt for each of these. So I'm going to show you what that looks like actually in VR. Okay, here we are. I wanted to show you the setup for how I used stop motion in virtual reality. It's a little bit wild. And you see the 13 basic poses that I narrowed it down to. Um, these are the sculpts. And then here are the individual frames that I brought in. So probably the most time consuming part about this, maybe equally with actually sculpting each of these, was getting these references images in. Basically, Medium was not created to be stop motion software. It was meant to just, you open one thing, you focus on one sculpt. So to bring in a new one, add this image. So I have all of here, these reference PNGs. You want to export these out frame by frame from your reference if you're using cell like me. So bring this in. And basically, what I had to do was go into this manipulation area and there are individual transformations. So I just had to X out everything. Um, there are people who know everything about the very mathematical side of medium. I don't spend a lot of time there. Um, this is really the time that I was just going through like uh, Xing everything out. So bringing those in X one by one, Xing out all of the parameters. Then I was able to sculpt these guys. Um, I think when I was sculpting these, it's nice to have them hit the frame itself because you can guess sort of like, okay, this goes here. So I was using a lot of this move tool, pushing and pulling. So I think if I finished like six and I was going to go to seven, I actually duplicated it and then, and then pushed and pulled it. Kind of like this. But if it wasn't quite working and maybe kind of add on to it, smooth it out and you do not have to export these individually I just turn them all on they can be they'll actually come in on their own layers anyway and then we can go through and turn them on and off in cinema to create the stop-motion effect okay so now that you've seen how this looked in medium hopefully that just kind of demystifies how I went about doing that um, and now I think probably where the comparison to the traditional stop motion would be, would be actually just the fact that I put the individual layers, the birds, on their own little null and then turn these on and off. So just in case you happen to not know, in any of these objects, in the basic setting, you can keyframe just the visible and editor on and off, pretty simple. So you can see the little green moving down. I could reuse some of these, the smooch vesting. So you can see here, I kind of nestled the this stop motion in here and ended up putting everything together in a null that could kind of move together, make them all kind of be under the same laws of physics. Um, I even had a, a bend that was kind of on all of them. Bloop, 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 bloop. It's pretty intuitive. We did this, I don't know, fairly quickly. I did end up spending a lot of time on just the details, the nuances of their the characters, but 
that was our process. Section 4, Quill. I'm going to give you a basic tour of Oculus Quill. We're going to look at brushes, importing reference, and kind of a lot of different possibilities that are in the program. We're going to look at importing a 3D mesh into Quill, actually the one that we made in Oculus Medium in the first section, and how to kind of work with it, draw on top of it. We're going to set up the texture in Cinema 4D to see the vertex colors from Quill. We're going to return to Cinema that first file we did, um, worked with in the first section, and we're going to import that file that we made in Medium and Quill. Okay, here we are in Quill. Um, we're in a project that's just a personal project of mine that's kind of um, mid-process right now. So just about the basics in here. I really like to use Quill to make uh, lightweight objects. So the geo on these are a lot simpler, and you can do a lot more with the painting and color. The color is basically this luminance channel look. If you're familiar with texturing, this kind of flat look. So when you're painting in Quill, it's a lot more like uh, painting with lots of little strips instead of one kind of mesh, like medium. So you can see, you can kind of see the geo actually when we turn on this little grid helper here and you move your hand closer, you can kind of see the grid, which is super useful because otherwise it's kind of this flat look. Um, another thing that I love about working in Quill is that there are blending modes. So just similar to what we, what we know from Photoshop, multiply, screen, you can color pick here and just a little multiply, you can see it's almost like toasting the ground a little bit. And it's a really nice way to get a bit of dimension. There's a lot you can do, obviously, gesturally in Quill, and this is all able to be exported as a 3D object. Quill also has an amazing animation feature. There are a ton of people doing incredible work, and actually you can see a lot of that in this Quill theater here, and a lot of great educators online. I, I'm not going to get into the animation today. Not only can you do frame by frame, you can also do this kind of motion capture where if you draw something on a layer, you can pick it up and move it, and it'll actually record where it is in space. It's very cool stuff. Okay, so this is one test we're gonna do. I'm gonna export this file, and we're gonna bring it into Cinema and build a shader where we can see all of these vertex colors. So I'll show you how to export that. Export 3D files. We'll call this the beach. It's inspired by Michigan's beach. Um, there's an Olympic option if you're going to do animation. We're not worrying about that now. I just wanted to show you that the gamma color space I've found a lot more luck with. Okay, I'll show you another way that I love to use Quill in terms of making content for cinema. All right, so this was for another underwater scene we did recently. I love to come in here and make kind of what I call like a toolbox or like a grab bag of just lots of different things that I can bring back into cinema. So what we see here is actually a reference image. Up here, um, new image layer, we can bring those in. One thing that's really cool about these is that you can reach up and just grab a color. So this is obviously great if you have a color palette that you're needing to work with on a project. So I'm gonna also export these and show you ways that I like to use to animate these, um, and also a way to unify these strips into one solid mesh if you need that for a project. Now I'm gonna show you one more cool thing in Quill. Okay, so I just opened a new project. Now I'm gonna show you how you can bring in 3D models into Quill. And I'm gonna bring in the model that we created together in Medium for the blend piece. So it's above me. And I wanna make sure now not to turn this on and not actually to scale it down and bring it to me. Undo is right joystick to the left. I want to keep this where it is and kind of scale down and come to this. Quill can actually read vertex colors from medium, which is really fun. So I wanted to show you that we can actually add Quill to the 3D pipeline, um, and medium is a great way to do that because we know that this mesh is going to play nice with our CinemaSculpt 
and we can import it. And as long as we don't move it around in that quill file first, we'll be able to draw on here and have that come in and sit in the right place in cinema also. All right. So let's say this is our masterpiece. I'm gonna save it out and we'll bring it back into our scene later. Okay, so we've brought the Beach FBX into a cinema file and it's kind of small. And the first thing you see actually is kind of how it's all made of these stripes. So the first thing you wanna do when you bring a quill file into cinema is actually multiply the scale by 100 on all of the dimensions. It is just exactly 100 times smaller. <laughs> So you can see here is our sky, and here's our detailed little beach. Okay, so let's make a texture where we can see everything. So we're gonna go to this drop down here, effects, and down to vertex map. So we open it up and we have to tell it which one. So all of these are named vertex color by default. So when I drag that in, that's the right one. And we actually wanna preserve these little um, selections that Quill has made. So we're just gonna bring this in and replace the textures that are there. Okay, so this is looking cool, although as you can tell, it's shadowy. So we're just gonna copy this shader and bring it into the luminance instead. So basically using the luminance channel is the best way to make it look just like it looks in Quill. Now I've also imported our little seaweed toolbox that we made together. So you can see really how these stripies are. So I just wanted to show you again um, a way that I use just simple deformers with this geo. Um, just with the vertex selections. This time I used a wind deformer. And again, that same restriction tag. And I like to make two versions of the wind. One is kind of pointing to the right and the other is kind of more of an up and down. And we still can preserve our vertex colors on these if we want, but you can see how there's kind of a nice deformation there. And I just wanna show you real quick how this geo is so light coming in from Quill. So it's a bit easier to work with. So here we have these round guys that I drew out. So if you're doing details in a scene, these might be kind of far away and they just might be fine with a little bit of the strippiness that comes in. But let's say that you change your mind and you actually kind of want one of these to be closer to the foreground and the strips won't really work anymore. Well, I love for this using the volume mesher. So it comes in kind of two pieces. The volume builder goes inside the volume mesher and basically this is kind of a way to glop everything together. So I'll pull our shelves in here and it kind of disappeared a bit because it's sensitive to the voxel size here. So just like we were talking about in medium, they're kind of just like these 3D pixels. And if it starts to lose data like that, you just make it smaller. And so you can already see that it's sort of pushing everything together to be one mesh. You can bring in these smooth tools and just kind of play with the settings on that. So if you haven't seen this before, I, I just made a plain old cylinder and pulled this in and it actually connects these things together. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of modify uh, your mesh with the volume mesher. I love it, super intuitive. Okay, so we're bringing this full circle. We're going back to our first scene that we did in Blend. And I wanna bring in that last project where we drew Quill on top of our medium file. See how that looks. Okay, so it's coming in small. Let's multiply it by 100. And there we are. So this was really exciting when I first discovered this. Um, so you can actually add both medium and quill into your pipeline to get some gestural natural 3D. So there we have it, a couple different ways that I use virtual reality programs in conjunction with cinema to make some awesome quick assets and then get stuff moving. So thank you so much for watching, everybody. Um, thanks for having me, Max, on. Thank you to my Gunner fam for all of your support. Um, even though we couldn't be there in person, I would love to meet you all, keep in touch. So here is my information. My Instagram is at Colin Likes, and that's Colin with two L's. Um, and my website is colinlikes.com. 
and Gunner is at Gunner Animation on Instagram and our website is gunner.work. So everybody stay safe and keep in touch. Bye.